So welcome everybody to the Rediscovery Channel uh, with your two armchair historians, Ivor and myself, Stilger, where each week we both look at a uh, different topic and we tell each other stories from history uh, that the other person may or may not know. And this way we're kind of rediscovering history together because uh, history is actually really cool. And um, Ivor, for, for this week's episode, um, I actually wanted to start off uh, with a question because um, um, I want to talk about somebody that uh, invented cynicism. And if I ask you right now, what do you think cynicism is? What would you say? Anything that comes to your mind? Um, yeah, usually it's taking a negative view of things or, you know, favoring towards like, uh, the worst case scenario, which could happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's actually the, the modern version of, uh, cynicism is, um, so when I looked this up on Wikipedia, so it's a distrust towards uh, professed ethical and social values, especially when there are high expectations concerning society, institutions, and authorities that are unfulfilled. It can manifest itself as a result of frustration, disillusionment, and distrust perceived as owing to organizations, authorities, and other aspects of society. Um, and people in a modern context are typically called cynical if they are deemed to have too little faith in their fellow human beings. Um, but cynicism itself started off quite differently. Um, the original cynics were Greeks um, who rejected any type of societal conventions in order to p pursue virtue. So uh, these people were basically pursuing traits and qualities that they deemed morally good. Uh, and the cynics specifically tried to focus on achieving personal or individual greatness. Um, so back in the day, being a cynic or cynical meant that, yes, you were very skeptical to what motivated individuals and especially the masses. Yep. But it came with a strong belief that rather than just accepting this as a fact and embracing some kind of nihilist worldview, that actually there was a, there was a way out. Like there was a, and that was a radical form of living uh, and that they sometimes refer to as the shortcut. It was like a philosophical shortcut. Um, and this was a way of life that even though I wouldn't recommend it, um, it was definitely an interesting approach to life in general. Um, that's fine. <laughs> and even uh, if it uh, may not have a lot of answers, I think it has some interesting answers. It, it definitely asks some really interesting questions. Uh, I got a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Teacher. Go ahead. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, I would do that with my college professors too. Uh, so the, Okay, so is this philosophy named after a particular guy? Yes. All right, yes. you're going to tell yeah. me who that guy is? I am, and I'm, I'm almost there. I'll, I'll get there. So. Okay, my bad. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Um, so, so this, this is, is actually uh, called after uh, Diogenes of Sinope, and also called Diogenes the Cynic, which is Greek for dog or dog life, like. Um, and he lived in the year uh, 404 to 323 before Christ. Um, and he was a follower of Antisthenes, who himself was a follower of uh, Socrates. Um, and after Diogenes um, comes one other guy, Crates or Crates, not sure how you pronounce it. Um, but you you write it as as crates basically like the kind you would find in Red Alert if you've ever played like C R A T E S like the box yes, yes. Yeah, yeah like, like crates, crates exactly. exactly yeah so what I heard about uh, the Greek pronunciations is that you're supposed to pronounce every letter and they don't have a silent e well actually they they use a different alphabet than we do anyways but. What I was told is to pronounce every letter. So probably his name is pronounced Krates. 
Okay, well, Krates um, was followed by Zeno, and Zeno is actually seen as the founder of Stoicism. Uh, yes. You know, and see, I don't even know that. But I do know that Stoicism is uh, is quite popular nowadays, I think, through in, in internet culture, um, where you have quite a few people looking into Marcus Aurelius. Um, and then there is one other guy that I think is quite... I, th I think PewDiePie was doing a video on him the other day. <laughs> but I think it's quite uh, interesting philosophy, right? It's all about finding virtue and, and uh, being in control of yourself and focusing on the things you have control over, etc. Um, but yeah, so um, cynicism is actually like a, a less practical version of, uh, of stoicism. And when I say it's impractical, because um, it, yeah, Diogenes was called the dog for a reason. So he, he kind of, um, he ended up living like a modern street dog, uh, not caring about his appearance. He would wear only like a simple cloak and he uh, carried a knapsack with his stuff in it. Um, and he would actually sometimes just make his home out of like an empty clay jar uh, or wine jar. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, he, he wanted to live like as close to nature as possible. Um, and if you were to call him like a hobo philosopher... Uh, you would probably paint like a pretty accurate picture in your mind of what he looked like and what he smelled like even. Um, so yeah, and Plato called uh, Diogenes like uh, Socrates gone crazy because he just uh, lived this extreme version of, um, of, of his philosophy. And it, and it wasn't because of uh, a lack of money. Um, although Diogenes, uh, before washing up in Athens, uh, where he... Uh, he lived out his life, uh, or a big part of his life, and he, he became the founder of this new philosophy. Um, before that, he was actually uh, banished from Sinope, which is a, was a, a Greek colony on the coast of the Black Sea, of what is nowadays uh, modern Turkey, uh, because um, uh, for, I think it was forgery of, um, of coins. Um, so I think his, his dad was like a, a banker, or was in charge of the money supply. And um, anyway, so um, he, he ended up in, in Athens. And, um, and there he started this life uh, where he just lived this radical life where he tried to discover like, okay, how can I be happy? And in order to do that, he was trying to cast off anything that he deemed unnecessary. Uh, for example, at one point, he saw a little boy drink water from a fountain using just his hand. And then he took his uh, wooden cup and he, uh, he smashed it into pieces and he cursed it for having carried it around all his life for nothing. So it's kind of like this radical philosophy about um, what you need, uh, not just in material possessions, uh, but also when it comes to not being a slave of your desires right that actually um, sounds a lot like buddhism it does it does, it does. It does. And, and um and it was actually there are ties there that people say well he also uh, influenced uh, asceticism later on uh potentially even into the early church when you had monks that would live the, the simplest of life except they would live out somewhere in the desert and he actually lived in the city and he was uh, going out like begging for money or but basically he felt like he deserved it because he thought that he was he was a teacher right he was out there yeah he was out there with all this wisdom and uh and they didn't even deserve you know him to be around pretty much and i have some some interesting quotes um coming up later uh but basically yeah so, um, yeah, exactly. It, it. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, well, he had Patreons, but instead of thanking them, he would like scoff at them and insult them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, but uh, it's interesting. So he kind of like became this figurehead in Athens and um, where he was well known and he, he started gathering some followers and... Um, and and actually, um, there were people that took up this this form of life at first in the in the Greek world, uh, but later also uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, where you would have pretty much in every Roman city, you would have some cynic uh, living among them, you know, all the way up to the fifth century uh, A.D. Um, yeah, or mostly the town square, you know, like the marketplace and. Um, and actually, uh, Julian, the apostate uh, Emperor Julian, uh, he complained that some of them weren't keeping true to the uh, true cynic uh, because they would basically start abusing uh, and behaving uh, scandalously for no reason other than their own enjoyment, uh, which was not the way that Diogenes lived for the most part, right? Um, anyway, um, but... I, uh, I, I yeah, maybe this sounds a little bit pretentious, but I, I saw this quote from Tolstoy the other day, uh, which I think is a, a little bit applicable to the fun function these cynics, cynics had in life. Uh, and it goes like this, quote, If then I were asked for the most important advice I could give, that which I considered to be the most useful for the men of our century, I should simply say, in the name of God, stop a moment, cease your work, look around you. Um, so this is basically, you know, what Diogenes was, uh, was doing because he was mostly, ex um, expressing out his philosophy while living out his life. And because of that, uh, you know, we don't have any big books left from him that are available, but we do have some really cool sayings and anecdotes, which I got from the book, uh, Diogenes the Cynic, Sayings and Anecdotes, which is a pretty cool book. And I can really recommend it. I think it's good for, to have on the, in the toilet or something. Because it has all these uh, cool little sayings with uh, little nuggets of, uh, of yeah, knowledge in them. Uh, some of them way better than others, but still. Um, yeah, so anyway, I, I would like to go through some of them. And hopefully at the end of it, you'll have a little bit of a better feel for what cynicism was about. Uh, how it relates to Stoicism, uh, and even how it has uh, ties to some modern philosophies like uh, MGTOW. Or how do you pronounce that? Is it like Mektau or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So men go their own way, right? That's that's one of them. Yeah, yeah, and, and and even there's like some stand-up comedy because he would like he would diss people or burn them pretty hard, uh, which was <laughs> pretty funny. Uh, okay, so so yeah, so here I you know uh, let me just go through a couple of them because there's so many. So for example, at one point he uh, he had a candle uh, that he lit in like full daylight light, and then he walked around with it through Athens, saying, "I'm in search of a man." basically saying that there were no men in Athens because they're all wimps. <laughs> yeah. Um, another one was uh, when someone asked him where in Greece he had seen good men, he replied, men nowhere at all, but boys in Sparta. So when they asked him why he was in Athens instead of Sparta, of whom he had a higher opinion, he said, but a doctor being a man who is responsible for bringing people to good health does not carry out his best business among those who are healthy. Um, and this one kind of reminded me of uh, church. <laughs> it's kind of like, why are there so many broken people in church? It's like, you know, it's like, why do you have so many broken people in hospital? Um, yeah, anyway. Jesus did say... Um... At one point, they asked him, like, why are you hanging out with all these sinners? And he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Although, I think, uh, you know, if I was in Greece back then and I saw this dude walking around in, like, his tunic and, you know, with, like, uh, 
like a hobo, you know, I'd probably be like, my dude, have you, how, you know, like, have you, um, like, have you not taken a look at your own situation, you know, like, and he says, you're, there's no real men here, I'd be like, okay, how much can you bench press? I don't know, I'd be like, why do, why do I want to listen to you, would be my first reaction, basically, like, have you seen yourself lately? Like, what yeah, oh, no, but, so but, great? so, I mean, he must have done something, I guess, to persuade people to follow him beyond being quaint, right? Yeah, he he was really. Oh, I hear bad feedback now. But he was really uh, witty in his remarks, and um, he also uh, he worked out quite a bit, actually. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he, he 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 was buff, and actually, at one point, um, Plato did say that some of his virtue signal it was kind of like virtue signaling on his part as well, because he was just using his um, his dirty clothes and and things like that, kind of to showcase that he didn't care. Um, so, for example, at one time, he he walked into a theater backwards as people were leaving it, and. Um, so yeah, and then when they laughed at him, he said, "Aren't you ashamed that while you are walking in the wrong direction along life's path, you scoff at me for walking backwards?" So he kind of did, did these things where it's like, yeah, you know, on the one hand, it's interesting philosophy, right? But then on the other hand, like, aren't you showing off a little bit there? Um, so yeah, um, and for example, when he saw some some men from Rhodes dressed up in like very nice and fancy clothing, he laughed. And he said, you know, that's sheer vanity. But then when he saw Spartans come, you know, and walk in filthy tunics and looking all rough and stuff. And then he said, well, that's just another kind of vanity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's many different sides to it, to this, I guess. Um, another one, for example, was at, at a dinner party. Some people were making fun of him by throwing bones at him. Uh, but then he just started pissing on them as if he were a dog. <laughs> so, so it, and I think that's part of his philosophy was uh, kind of not giving a, a crap about what society thinks of you. And I, I think that's really interesting. Um, when he had, sorry, you know, he really tried to distance himself, like shame himself in front of um, in front of groups because he really wanted to, um, not feel any peer pressure. And I guess that was his way was f- of distancing himself was by acting in such a crazy way and by looking a certain way. And even if he had people that were like, well, hey, I want to be your follower, he would have them do ridiculous things, kind of like as an in- initiation, you know, like he'd have them walk around the market with like uh, uh, a broken bottle on, on um rope or something or carrying a fish around or you know like the silly stuff just because if they weren't able to do it because they were too ashamed of it like of what others might think um then he he wouldn't take them in uh, because that was his philosophy is like people are living their lives and they're not even aware of why they're living the way they're living uh, because they're simply just doing what everybody else is doing and this for him was a way to distance himself from them and to force himself to think about, okay, what is actually virtue? What isn't? Um, what makes sense? What does, what is, what is going to make me happy? And there are a lot of ties to that, to like, you know, um, to seeking adversity and learning to enjoy adversity instead of pursuing wealth. Um, he would actually say, you know, if you learn to, enjoy adversity like uh you'll be a happy man so yes there are ties to buddhism there there are ties to christianity there as well and definitely to yeah stoicism right um so yeah i mean there mm-hmm. and people would say why are you wearing this or that and i'd be like anybody you know can change their clothes but the real work is to change your body and like get in shape and strong. So I kind of I kind of agree with what he's saying actually. Where you know, 
kind of preferring the Spartans over the Athenians and people that wear fine clothes is just like window dressing or, or putting another coat of paint on the outside of your house doesn't really make your house any stronger. You know, and, and if your house is falling apart at the foundation, a new coat of paint is not going to help. But anyways. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and like what you mentioned about the Buddhists, like the Buddhists would like go on a mountain, right? And separate themselves that way. And I guess he, he separated himself not by, yeah, by living somewhere in the desert, but just uh, by, by just upsetting people and scaring them off and, um, and doing that on purpose. And, and uh, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. I don't believe with it, but I think it's really interesting, like around that age of when you're in your like late, uh, or maybe in your late 18s or early 20s, when you're trying to think of like, you know, what is life is what life is about. Then I think this, uh, this guy is an interesting guy to read more about. And he had some interesting thoughts. Um, uh, you know, not that I agree with them, but uh, with all of them. But yeah, anyway um you know um but he you know he had some let me go for some of these other sayings uh for for example he said it was a privilege of the gods to need nothing and those who are who are like the gods to need little so it's again about uh not needing a lot of stuff um he also had a disdain for superfluous knowledge so he marveled that the grammarian should uh inquire into the misfortunes of odysseus while remaining ignorant of their own uh, that musicians should tune the strings of their instruments while their soul was out of harmony, that mathematicians would calculate the trajectories of heavenly bodies, yet fail to see what lies at their feet, and how orator orators do an excellent job at praising justice and yet never practice it. Um, so, and to somebody who said, who, who was not interested in philosophy, he said, then why live at all if you have no interest in living well? Um, and here comes the Mechtau part. Um, <laughs> so uh, when somebody asked, uh, what is the right time to marry? He replied, for those who are young, not yet. For those who are older, never at all. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> but then again, like if you, if you, I've seen some of these Mechtau videos and these guys are actually, they, they're more like, children because all they care about is their money and uh, oftentimes childish hobbies but uh, anyway <laughs> well I've, i was being a little uh doing a little diogenes there myself but uh oh yeah but he had some other cool uh, jokes or cool jokes interesting jokes probably a little uh dicey um, for example, about uh, when he saw one woman advising another, he said, the adder is acquiring poison from the viper. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And uh, seeing a woman who was beautiful but small, he said, small is the beauty, but great is the evil. Um, and he has some racist, uh, he has some racist jokes about Ethiopians as well. <laughs> And some of them are like really childish and stuff. So I don't know if I should even mention those. Um, uh, but yeah, it's like one of them is about an Ethiopian eating white bread or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just going to skip that one. Um, yeah. And there was a, there was one where he saw a, a second rate wrestler practicing as a doctor. And then he said, is this how you're planning to bring down those who defeated you? Um, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, and then when a bald person was uh, like making fun of him and insulting him, he said, I won't insult you in return, but simply congratulate your hair for having taken flight from such an evil head. <laughs> so that was a solid burn, right? <laughs> um and apparently, like, he met Alexander the Great, but we're not sure about this. But anyway, but uh, let's say it's it's true, which I'd like to think it's true. So when Alexander the Great came through Athens, he walked up to Diogenes and asked him, uh, what can Alexander the Great do for you? 
at which uh, Diogenes said, um, could you please get out of my son? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, supposedly, like, Alexander was so impressed that he said, if I weren't Alexander, I would want to be Diogenes. Um, yeah, and so, and then Diogenes said, if I weren't Diogenes, I would want to be Diogenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, this guy's got a lot of wisdom in it, even though, you know, and he had some wits. Um, and he, he talked he talked about like, uh, you know, education is a source of self-control for the young. It's a consolation for the old. It's a treasure for the poor and an adornment for the rich. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and, and then he said, when someone asked how one can become a teacher to oneself, he replied, by reproaching, first of all, in oneself, those faults that one reproaches in others. Hmm. And that sounds kind of New Testament to me as well. Right? For, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he also said uh, when he saw someone living a shameful life, reproaching someone else for the very same thing, he said it's like you're blowing a pile of... Uh, it's like uh, blowing a pile... Of, no, wait... You're like a pile of ashes trying to blow against the wind. Um, and he also said about using humor. He said, uh, just as doctors use honey to sweeten their medicine, wise men use humor to sweeten their dealings with disagreeable people. And this made me think of uh, the Babylon Bee, which we talked about the other day. It's how they're trying to uh, to talk about certain things using humor. You know, instead of going straight to hate, which I think is a is a really good uh, good thing. Um, like I got a couple more, and then I think we can close it off. Um, yeah, he said on picking friends, he said how absurd it is that when we go on a on a trip, we want to pick the best travel companions, but then when it comes to living our lives, we end up just choosing whoever chance uh, puts on, on our paths. Um, yeah. Oh, and when he at you know the mm. kind of things he's saying mm -hmm. are are still he would have the same kind of things to say if he were alive today. Like so many people just doing what others around them are doing without giving it any thought, or you know maybe maintaining a system or trying to without questioning why this system was created in the first place and what purpose it serves. Yeah. Yeah, he was all about questioning about yeah, why do we do the things we do, right? And uh, how do you how do you how do you actually what actually matters and how you know? And he thought it like things like being a man and uh, being physically fit and being smart and educated. Uh, those things are more important than pleasure and uh, wealth and you know trying to be liked by other people. He didn't really hold much of those things right um so yeah um you know and this one about physical fitness for example people would laugh at him when he was doing his exercises because he would exercise and then he said you know there will come a day when you will see the people that the people that are laughing now shriveled up by illness and then they will reproach themselves for their idleness so um yeah i mean um, and, and then he said, like, uh, you know, there are two kinds of training, the mental and the bodily kind. Nothing in life can be brought to a successful conclusion without training. It is capable of overcoming anything. So instead of wasting our life with useless exertions, we should choose those that are in accordance with nature if we are to live a happy life. But through their foolishness, people are unhappy. Um, and he would also say that most people brought themselves alive by softening up their bodies in baths and wasting themselves away in sexual intercourse. Um, he would talk about how the path to Hades is an easy one. Uh, people set off along it with their eyes shut. Um, yeah, and oh yeah, and what he said about philosophers, he said, when asked what philosophers, how they are better than normal people, he replied, if all the laws were repealed, we would continue to live in just the same way. So that basically goes back to what you just said, right? Jeez, like, why do you do certain things? 
uh, like he thought, like if you already if you fought them through and society would fall apart, nothing would change for you because you just do them because you do them for you. But you feel like they're the right things to do and they're the things that make you happy. So, um, yeah. I find this, yeah. Uh, I actually find this philosophy philosophy to be pretty relatable, you know, and I've I've said this with other people before, you know, like um, without getting too political, but, you know, some of us, if the government fell away tomorrow and there was no more law enforcement, some of us wouldn't change our behavior at all or the way that we treat others, whereas a lot of people would suddenly become barbaric tribes, you know, looting and pillaging. They would, because a lot for a lot of people, it's only the um, the fear of reprisal that keeps them down. And I I really think that it's most of humanity that's like that. Like uh, you know that uh, you know that I I went to India, and when I went there, you know, before I went there, I I had this philosophy that uh, you know I was considering the idea that maybe we should have some type of anarchic uh, system like give anarchy a try but and then and then as I was going down the streets I saw advertisements painted on everything like the sides of the buildings the sides of the roads the sides of people's houses of course most houses over there have like a wall around them anyways and I thought wow you know there's no graffiti here but there's uh, people advertising everywhere and I asked you know like um, I thought, I just assumed that everybody was making a profit to have those advertisements on the sides of their houses and buildings and roads, uh, you know, because in the United States, you would get paid for that if you hosted someone else's advertisement, you know, even if it's a sticker on the side of your car. Turns out that um, the reason there's advertisements everywhere is because the law enforcement isn't bothered about uh, most things. So I was told, you know, this is India. The, the law enforcement doesn't, the cops don't do anything. If you want to paint something, you just go and paint something. So like they don't have graffiti like we have here, but they have advertisements everywhere. And it, it, if you just want to advertise your business, you just open it up. Well, here's a wall. I can go paint this wall and no one will do anything. Now, I wouldn't go do that because it's someone else's wall. But because the, the law enforcement doesn't care, they don't take up cases unless it's like somebody important, then people do that stuff. And, you know, if you're in the United States and you see a wall with all kinds of graffiti on it, usually that's a clue that you probably should, should not stay in that area, you know, very yeah. long, particularly if it's nighttime. That might actually be where modern uh, cynicism and uh, the old version of cynicism align. Like the idea that, um, that yeah, like uh, that the crowds would, if there weren't rules and things to keep things together, everything would fall apart. I guess the uh, Diogenes probably felt the same way, but I think the big difference here is that he felt that there was a different, there was another way, and that was, you know, through philosophy and through examining oneself, that uh, that individuals could actually find like the right path of living life, um, which is actually, you know, is also found in in Christianity, and it makes me think of uh, Kierkegaard as well, who would complain that there, I think he mentioned that he thought that there were very few uh, real Christians and that a lot of people are just following a religious community. And if that would fall apart, then there would not be much left of that. Um, so, but yeah, that's like the, the modern version of cynicism, but the emphasis of the old version of cynicism is on finding the right path, uh, regardless of any of those uh, social structures and so social norms, because you should be living your own life. You should live it, be living it for yourself and not because of what anybody else is telling you, um, but because it's the right thing to do. And in the end, it's what will make you happy. Um, maybe to close it off. Um, so Diogenes, he, uh, he ended up dying an old man. He did become, uh, I think he became enslaved at one point in time. 
Uh, but even what, as he was enslaved, uh, he was probably more free than most others are. Um, he even ended up picking up the person to buy him. When he was asked, uh, what are you good at? He said he was good at ruling men. And so then he ended up uh, raising uh, the man's son, sons uh, of the man who bought him. Um, and he ended up dying an old man somewhere in his 90s. And how he died is not sure. There are different versions. The one I choose to believe is the one where he just held his breath until he died. <laughs> Which I think is a pretty manly way to go. Uh, but there are other ones where he ate like raw squid or something, or, uh, he was bitten or they were just trying to feed some dogs and uh, with, with the squid. And then they ended up biting him or something like that. Um, but yeah, this is, um, the, the, the cynic philosophy. And there are all these cynics living in the cities of the Roman empire for many centuries to come. Um, all the way to the fall of the Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire, and um, uh, but the uh, it was then later on taken into Stoicism, which is you know a lot more practicable because you don't have to live like a hobo. Um, <laughs> it still has you know some of those wisdoms in it. Um, but yeah, that was my story of uh, of the week. Diogenes the Cynic, pretty cool guy. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, it reminds me, I, I want to learn more about Stoicism. Um, because honestly, I don't know much about it. And I don't know what it's like over there. I think in the US, Greek culture is more prominent than it is over, at least over here in Holland. Uh, but I really don't knew all the, I don't really know all that much about, you know, philosophy. I know Plato, I know Socrates, you know, that's about it. So one to get all this stuff like when i was in middle school and in high school we did talk about uh different greek philosophers and also you know we um we had to we read the greek mythology like edith hamilton's mythology was part of my required reading when i was in eighth or ninth grade and then um we also uh we also had uh it popping up again and again in entertainment, you know, like uh, Hercules, The Legendary Journeys is one example with Kevin Sorbo. Of course, that is grossly inaccurate historically, but... <laughs> yeah, but it's entertaining, right? So, yeah. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I mean, for, for us, I don't think it's, it's just... Um... You know, unless you're going to like the the high, like you go to gymnasium over here, um, and maybe uh, you can take Greek and Latin then, uh, or you have to take those. But like if you're going to go into a commercial position or something like that, or you're going to work with your hands, then you learn little to nothing about uh, Greek philosophy, yeah, which I think it's a shame because there's so many interesting, uh, so much interesting stuff in there. And actually, there there's a whole another branch in this book, um, which is like the complete opposite of uh, of this philosophy. It's called the Cyrenaic success, um, tradition, which is like another uh, follower of Socrates. And uh, this one included followers like Theodorus the Atheist and Hegesias the Death Persuader, who basically persuaded people to kill themselves. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and these guys were all about like maximizing pleasure because life was all about pleasure and there is no reality as far as we know and uh, really all that we can trust is uh is how much we enjoy ourselves it's basically like a very simplified version Wait, of it is that uh is that not epicureanism or Ooh. is it related to epicureanism i don't, I don't know, know. I, I, I heard that uh, the Epicureans were like the philosophical um, opposition to the Stoics, where they were they were like more about embracing emotion and I want to say having fun. But actually, I, I never really looked much into Epicurean philosophy when I was in uh, when I was a kid. I heard about it and I rejected it because they said that. Um, they they were more into 
embracing emotions and stuff and i thought that was a weak philosophy from the beginning you know yeah and and the the way i actually found this book is i think it it was recommended after reading uh, The Fountainhead by uh, Ayn Rand with objectivism. And Rand is probably influenced by the Stoic philosophy. And I wouldn't be surprised if... No, no, yeah. No, I, I was going to say something, but I don't... I don't... Yeah, I mean, her, her main character, um, was it Roger Rourke? Rourke, oh, I can't think of his name right now. He didn't give a two cents about what other people thought anyway and he just lived life the way he wanted to live life and what he you know what he uh felt to be good and and in that way i guess he was truly a cynic um but then in a classical sense but if you haven't read the fountainhead yet um it's definitely a recommended reading but yeah uh, i would i would start with the fountainhead because it really, yeah, but this one really goes into the philosophy of objectivism. Um, so, and I think it does a really good job at explaining it for this. Howard Rourke is the, the main protagonist. Anyway, yeah, man, that was my story. And uh, we got some recommendations and we're going to be working on those. Uh, we got some comments as well. Yeah, yeah, we got to do that one. Yeah, and um, we appreciate it. And if you want to share this uh, podcast or video, uh, we we got pictures for it. Um, you can see them on BitChute or YouTube. Uh, we're also audio only on the podcast channels. Yeah, if you want to share it, we really do um, appreciate it. We're still hoping to grow and get some more people and get some more recommendations uh, not because we want to make any money. We don't care. We just want to have fun. And uh, and we really like history. And we hope you like you do too. So, um, so yeah, let us know. And anything you want to add, Ivor? No, I think you said... Uh, you said it perfectly. You know, and, and the risk of sounding pedantic. Or, or, or I should say... Yeah, I guess... Uh, at the risk of sounding cheesy. Let's say that, rather. Uh, do leave a like, subscribe, and uh, recommend our... Well, more importantly, most importantly, if you really do enjoy our content, give us some feedback and also share our videos. And I think that's everything that needs to be said. All right, guys. Appreciate it. And I uh, hope you see you in the next one.